So now it's useful to look at what was the core curriculum of Nalanda University and these great culture creating universities during uh, those, uh, this thousand years or 1500 years from Buddha's time to their destruction in India. There were at least five main subjects known as a group as inner sciences. Actually, there was no word Buddhism during this period until quite a late date. And these scholars were known as students and teachers of the inner sciences. And a Buddhist was literally called an innerist, literally an adhyatmika, a nangba in Tibetan, and adhyatmika in Sanskrit. Now, the logic and epistemology was the first of the topics, which is pramana or tsema, pramana in Sanskrit, tsema in Tibetan. And this taught people basically how to reason and communicate effectively in both how to reason within their own minds in what is called internal inference and how to communicate with others in what is called logical syllogism or external inference. And uh, in order to develop the analytic tools to discover the true nature of reality, systematically based on a sophisticated science of linguistics. In other words, in the Indian inner science tradition, if you're going to be a scientist, you have to be a philosopher. You have to understand what you're doing when you formulate term terminologies and uh, even mathematics, use mathematics. But mathematics is not the primary language. Actually, Sanskrit, meaning a thoroughly made scholarly language, Sanskrita language, a thoroughly composed language, was considered more important than mathematics. Second, although mathematics was not unimportant, and actually it was the Indians who invented the decimal system, everyone should know. So they were no slouches in regard to mathematics. Two, metaphysical philosophy, empirical inner science, a kind of phenomenology of the altered states of the inner scientist. Centrism, the discovery of emptiness and its non-duality with relativity, uh, being its implication, a discipline of investigation of mind and nature with a view to experiencing experimentally, internally, this deepest reality, cultivating experiential wisdom. That's the second major uh, element in the curriculum. And this is truly, this is a Buddhist physics, actually. It's looking into the nature of atoms, subatomic particles, uh, the way that uh, the life and relationships and causality functions to the deepest, deepest level, and uh, thereby discovering, of course, emptiness and relativity, which were the central theories. In a way, the discovery of emptiness is very parallel to the discovery of the decimal system, the, which is based on the discovery of the usefulness of zero, if you will. Uh, really interesting, that connection, although no one has made that, including me, properly, of looking at history of Indian mathematics and connecting it with history of emptiness. Not yet. Next generation of scholars, you guys, will do that. Three, a phenomenology of inner experiences attained by supernormal control of mental concentration, a cumulative tradition of experimental and clinical positive psychology, which we can call transcendent wisdom, prajna paramita, transcendentalism focused on wisdom as a generation of compassion and personal well-being. Now, this, in a way, is interconnected very much with centrism, this transcendentalism. Uh, but it has to do with the um, sort of phenomenology of the states of experience of the explorer who engages in the inner experiments or the experiential concentrations and reaches into the alternate states, altered states that the inner scientist reaches through highly concentrated meditative expertise. This, of course, is not credible in or understandable, let's say, to modern people who think that only you can investigate reality with microscopes and telescopes and with artificial machinery. But, but the Indian tradition discovered that the brain itself, the senses, the breath system, the central nervous system, is like a machine. It can be mobilized with a very high degree of control, which is uh, developed through concentrated meditation, long experience, and very systematic you know, monitoring of the breath process and the energy flow within the, within the system. 
uh, sort of mind over matter, one's own, one, the nervous matter of one's own being, and, uh, and thereby develop a kind of microscope and telescope and whatever kind of machine, electron accelerator of your own mind, of your own brain, actually. That's at least the claim, and I, which I know sounds very unusual to materialistically brought up people, but this is the claim which we should investigate before we dismiss out of hand, in fact. Number four, and this, four, this third thing is the actual study of the phenomenology of those altered states. Number four, karmic biology, what I call, of the various life forms, the processes of death and the between states, and cosmology, astronomy, and mathematics, all under the four known in Buddhism as Abhidharma, or super teaching, something like that, the inner science of evolution connected to the outer sciences. And here, this is most fascinating because, you know, the Buddhist, the, using this incredible inner concentration, these Buddhist great scholar yogis developed the ability to do what is called lucid dreaming, which has been empirically developed and tested today by modern psychologists in some centers in the U.S. and in abroad, where you can wake up in a dream and be aware that you're dreaming but not wake up into the waking state and then use the dream state to learn things and do things voluntarily and exert, in other words, your will in the dream state. This is, this is very, now we know that they're able to do that. That's an ancient yoga of these, uh, these uh, scholar adepts. And then even they took that level of subtle self-awareness of their own internal biological processes into lucid dying, actually, and going through the processes of, of, of uh, actual losing consciousness in death, achieving a dreamlike after-death state. In that after-death state, then understanding how the death process works, how the rebirth process works, and totally empirically discovered it and described it in great detail which this has resulted eventually in things like the famous Tibetan Book of the Dead, which is a missed title. But all of this was done during this period by these kind of great inner scientists, again, to be investigated ourselves clearly before being dismissed out of hand based on materialistic dogma. So, and so out of that then a biology was developed where the role of the mind, not in terms of some theistic God controlling everything, but in terms of the mind controlling the shaping of plasma, if you will, into bio and genetic things, in the epigenetic atmosphere of, being, of the rebirth process and of the life process. So that mind as a component in the morphology of biological beings is posited in the karmic theory, which is a theory of evolution. It is not at all a matter of basic fate and so forth, as we have already discussed, or of some will of the gods. It is in completely an empirical thing of mind in relationship to matter. Not saying that matter is, is all only mind, just like you, you know, as if that were just the opposite of materialists saying that mind is only matter. Mind and matter can be taken as separate, they can be taken as the same in either direction, is the sort of open, non-dogmatic aspect of Buddhist sciences. The fifth topic is ethics, which connects to the Vinaya discipline, which is the behavioral conditioning regime of the Buddhist mendicant, but also has to do with lay people's way of controlling through mindfulness their reactive, emotional reactive patterns and, and, and mental patterns so as to improve and ameliorate their interaction in societies, namely ethics. So social management and amelioration for monastics and laypersons branching into political economy, in other words, large collectives, what is the ethic of collectives, of the government and so forth, counsel to government, many Buddhist texts written, counseling kings, and so on, and used, and this was also in the curriculum of the monastic universities. Now there was a group of great scholar scientist adepts over 700 of them represented as authors in the Tibetan collection of their library, of the translations of the text of their library. And uh, recently the Dalai Lama, who is a great scholar in this tradition, uh, in the Tibetan language, has using those surviving texts in that language, he has picked out a set of 17 what he calls the great pandits, which means the top scholars and scientists, the most notable ones ranging from the great Nagarjuna 
around one, somewhere around 100 before the Common Era to 500 of the Common Era. The Buddhists claim he lived 600 years. We don't really, it's very difficult for us to, to fit that into our mind. But anyway, he seems to have a broad range of things, so much so that some people have theorized there were three or four Nagarjunas, but that the Indians were too stupid to take note of that fact, which is a little bit silly. But anyway, they, there's, he seems to have been doing things that are attributed to him over such a long period. But uh, mythically, he supposed to supposedly live that long because he was an alchemist and a doctor, and somehow he had a real longevity key, which they'd love to have in California if there ever was such a thing. But anyway, we don't have to deal with that. He was around then, we can say. His major disciple, Aryadeva, around 100 of the Common Era. Asanga, around 5th, 4th, and 5th century. Vasubandhu, same time as Asanga. Dignaga, 5th. Gunaprabha, 5th. Bhavya, Viveka, the 6th. Uh, Chandrakirti, the 7th. Dharmakirti, the 7th. And Shantideva, the 8th, late 7th and early 8th. So these are among them. There are actually 17 of them all around in this, but running up right up to 1,000 uh, toward the end of the Indian tradition, Atisha. Uh, uh, so he has picked out this particular set, and they have a, com a combined number of 491 different works uh, in the Tibetan translation collection, which we are seeking. We have a project to try to translate all of that nowadays. Um, there was also research and teaching of the outer sciences, of course. It isn't that those were neglected. And the practical arts, linguistics, math, law, medicine, botany, chemistry, poetics, literary criticism, very sophisticated uh, tradition of that, history, architecture, metallurgy, sculpture, painting, and other fine arts. There are too many subjects here to explain them all in detail. But just to mention the most important of them all, again, just to underline them, which were the centrism, which I, I consider a kind of physics, actually, and transcendentalism, which is a kind of phenomenology of the states, of the physicists, of the scientists that they reach when they develop this higher intensity of penetration into reality. They, in a way, they, atoms, they smash the atoms mentally, uh, not just in sort of thought experiment verbally, but through visual, inner vision thought experiment, where they actually see the atoms come apart. Somehow they get down to the machine language of the neurons, which of course are atoms interacting with atoms, subatomic particles interacting with subatomic particles, and somehow impredicable quantum energies interacting with impredicable quantum energies. They get down to where they lucidly are aware of those of those things, and that the phenomenology of that is covered in the transcendentalism element of the curriculum. And so this is the claim of the inner sciences and the inner scientists of the Indic Buddhist traditions, which the Tibetans consider themselves the heirs of. And uh, as I say, finally, the challenge for modern outer scientists or material, scientific materialists is to investigate this and either approve or disprove, not just dismiss out of hand as theoretically impossible, revealing their own dogma, dogmatism about materialism.